All right, we're live. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad. Today we pray for the repose of the soul, not only of Pope Benedict, but more recently Cardinal George Pell, who was an amazing Australian cardinal who was falsely accused um, to have committed sexual abuse. He was even imprisoned for it. I had the great privilege of speaking in Australia, my home country, a couple of years ago, and I got to stand outside of his prison cell and, and pray for him there. Earlier than that, it was either at World Youth Day in Rome or Canada, I forget which one, my bishop, Bishop Eugene Hurley, introduced me to Cardinal Pell on an aeroplane. I remember, first of all, realizing just what a tall man he was. He used to play Aussie rules football, so he was a big guy. He was constantly under attack by the Australian media, our NPR types in Australia, whatever that translates to in Australia, were always going after him. The reason people were so angry with him is that he believed and held to, t taught unambiguously what the Catholic Church teaches and will never change, right, on human sexuality. They hated him, absolutely hated the guy. But this is why the young people especially loved him, because he was just like a clear light. Today, among other things, I want to read uh, something. This came out from The Spectator. This, if I'm not mistaken, is his final article that he ever wrote. Um, this comes from The Spectator. You feel free to throw this up. Shortly before he died on Tuesday, Cardinal George Pell wrote the following article for The Spectator in which he denounced Can the Vatican. real quick just move the window over to the right a little bit? Sure. Like that? Yeah, that's good. Right there. Uh, it's fine. Just leave what it. What about that? Is that good? Leave it. It's <laughs> something terrible. I can. There you go. Boom. Um, the Spectre, in which he denounced the Vatican's plans for its forthcoming Synod of Synodality as a toxic nightmare. So we want to get to that in a minute, but I want to kind of say something before we, we get to this. You know, I just had an episode the other day in which we talked about schismatics. We, we talked about set of accountists and things like this. And... So it might seem surprising now that I'm going to read an article from Cardinal George Pell uh, calling the church to kind of amend the way in which it's, say, listening or proclaiming the truth. One thing I'm seeing in the church today which bothers me is this knee-jerk reaction. So you've got a lot of YouTube channels out there that are continually criticizing Pope Francis and the bishops. And I think people have their fill of that. They get tired of that. And then they want to say, no, 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 Pope Francis is a great pope. He's a saint. He's the best. All of the Germans, are, the German bishops, and all the bishops are perfect. We don't need to do that. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. I think you can hold, I think you could think, I'm not publicly making this statement, but I think you could say that Pope Francis, you wouldn't trust him to catechize your children. I think you could say that and also acknowledge him as the true pope. So I don't think we want to fall into either side. We don't want to fall into apostasy. We don't want to fall into schism. Obviously, God save us from those things. But we also don't want to fall into the trap of saying that the church is beyond criticism, that the pope, that the bishops, that the priests, that ourselves are beyond criticism. Certainly the pope wouldn't think that. Surely he'd be the first to say, I'm open to criticism. I think if you ask the bishops officially, they would say the same thing. Canon law seems to say this. They, they're constantly, within the last few years, constantly ragging against clericalism. So they surely, I mean, I, I want to take them at their word and think that they would like us to speak out. Yep, with with, with as much charity, charity as yeah. we're able. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae talked about how we can indeed criticize our bishops. And let's, let's first of all, for those who are like, what what is synodality anyway? So here's an article on CNA from Ed Condon. He says this, the term is often used to describe the process of fraternal collaboration and discernment that Bodies like the Synod were created to express, but some critics have suggested that the term is vaguely defined, and this is why like people don't know what it is when you ask them. They think it has something to do with listening, but they're not sure, and that I think is illustrative of the fact that it is vaguely defined, and can be used in a move toward a more democratic or parliamentary way of governing the church and, and teaching doctrine. Before you see what Pope Francis had to say, any thoughts on that? No, I think that um, what you and I were just saying before we went live is that that sounds great if we weren't in a time where it's clear that we need to do more teaching than listening. Yeah. I think um, this is Ralph Martin, Dr. Ralph Martin's opinion on the Second Vatican Council. It says Second Vatican Council, 
fantastic, beautiful, documents are wonderful, needed, whatever ambiguities were within the text have been clarified. His critique is of the spirit of Vatican II, if by that you mean, well, we just need to run around listening to heretics and listening to people who oppose church teaching. Surely that is true. We do need to listen to people, even those who disagree with the church. It's not as if they are not coming from anywhere uh, of goodwill. Many are, many aren't. But that we have to instruct, we have to be instructed, especially in a day and age like this, where we don't know what the church teaches. And guess what? Hell exists and it's eternal and it's possible. Then it's an act of charity for the church at some point to cease its listening and start its commanding, start its rebuking. And this is what makes me really sympathetic to where the trads are at. I mean, we criticize, people criticize the mad trads. I think, and you and I were just speaking about this, there's a legitimate reason trads are mad, and I think this is one of them. Yeah, I think what we just, you know, just, I mean, like we keep, you and I keep saying we were just saying, so we we talked about this to make sure that we were very clear with what we were saying, because we didn't want to say anything too far one way or the other. We wanted to be clear. Um, and what we kind of settled on was saying that we don't think that the, like we don't want to say and accuse the hierarchy of falling short of the spiritual works of mercy, but that we are sympathetic and understand those who perceive it in that manner and don't want to tell them that they are somehow yeah. insane or accuse them of being ridiculous. We don't want to having... gaslight people from either side. Yeah. And yeah. so what we want to say is very clearly, we understand if you have perceived it in that way that they are falling short of the spiritual work of mercy of, mercy of rebuking the sinner. Yeah. And, and, and in case you're and, thinking to yourself, we have no right to bring uh, our issues and concerns to our bishops. If you think that, then you're at odds with Pope Francis. Pope Francis, it says on this CNA article, launched the Synod of Synodality in October 2021 as a worldwide undertaking during which Catholics were encouraged to submit feedback to their local dioceses. I'll be doing that. Yeah. Pope Francis is the bishop of the diocese of what? The Va of Rome? Of Rome. Yeah, so he of is Rome. open to receiving feedback. And we have a prince of the church who's gone to his eternal reward who has offered his feedback. And that's what we want to read through today. Yeah. And and if you if you feel one way or the other about the synod on synodality, it sounds like the, the Holy Pontiff is asking you to sum, submit feedback to your bishop. So you here know? it is, baby. The Catholic, and this is from the late Cardinal, uh, George Cardinal Pell. The Catholic Synod of Bishops is now busy constructing what they think of as God's dream of synodality. Unfortunately, this divine dream has developed into a toxic nightmare, despite the bishops' professed good intentions. They have produced a 45-page booklet which represents its account of the discussions of the first stage of listening and discernment held in many parts of the world. And it is one of the most incoherent documents ever sent out from Rome. While we thank God that Catholic numbers around the globe, especially in Africa and Asia, are increasing, the picture is radically different in Latin America with losses to the Protestants as well as the secularists. With no sense of irony, the document entitled Enlarge the Space of Your Tent, and the aim of doing so is to accommodate not the newly baptized, those who have answered the call to repent and believe, but anyone who might be interested enough to listen. Participants are urged to be welcoming and radically inclusive. No one is excluded. The document does not urge even the Catholic participants to make disciples of all nations, much less to preach the Savior in season and out of season. The first task for everyone, and especially the teachers, is to listen in the spirit according to this recent update of the Good News Synodality as a way of being for the church is not to be defined but just to be lived. It revolves around five creative tensions, starting from radical inclusion and moving towards mission in a participatory style, practicing co-responsibility with other believers and people of goodwill. Difficulties are acknowledged, such as war, genocide, and the gap between the clergy and laity, but all can be sustained, say the bishops, by a lively spirituality. The image of the church as an expanding tent with the Lord at its center comes from Isaiah. And the point of it is to emphasize that this expanding tent is a place where people are heard and not judged, not excluded. 
So we read that the people of God need new strategies, not quarrels and clashes, but dialogue, where the distinction between believers and unbelievers is rejected. The people of God must actually listen, it insists, to the cry of the poor and of the earth. Because of differences of opinion on abortion, contraception, the ordination of women to the priesthood and homosexual activity, some felt that no definitive position on these issues can be established or proposed. Shame on them. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm not sorry. No, don't Shame apologize. on them. This is also true of polygamy and divorce and remarriage. However, the document is clear on the special problem of the inferior position of women and the dangers of clericalism. Although, so there we go. Although the positive contribution of many priests is acknowledged. What is one to make of this potpourri, this outpouring of New Age goodwill? It is not a summary of Catholic faith or New Testament teaching. It is incomplete, hostile in significant ways to the apostolic tradition and nowhere acknowledges the New Testament as the word of God. Normative for all teaching on faith and morals. The Old Testament is ignored, patriarchy rejected, and the Mosaic law, including the Ten Commandments, is not acknowledged. Two points can be made initially. The two final synods in Rome in 2023 and 24 will need to clarify their teachings on moral matters. As the relator, chief writer and manager, Cardinal Jean-Claude Hollerich, has publicly rejected the basic teachings of the church on sexuality on the grounds that they contradict modern science. We did look up that quote, and that is a correct yeah. characterization. Repent, Cardinal. Of repent. Part. In normal times, this would have meant that his continuing as relator was inappropriate, indeed impossible. The synods have to choose whether they are servants and defenders of the apostolic tradition on faith and morals, or whether their discernment compels them to assert their sovereignty over Catholic teaching. They must decide whether basic teachings on the on things like priesthood and morality can be parked in a pluralist limbo where some choose to redefine sins downwards and most agree to differ respectfully. Outside the synod, discipline is loosening, especially in northern Europe, where a few bishops have not been rebuked, even after asserting a bishop's right to dissent, a de facto pluralism already exists more widely in some parishes, and religious orders on things like blessing homosexual activity. Any thoughts before we... I think we're about halfway through. Sorry, I... Uh, no, you're fine. I'm skimming the... the just the fact I, that... I'm skimming the... You know, the other thing we should have done before we went live, <laughs> I found the document that he's referring to. Yeah. So I'm skimming it and just kind of... The fact that we have a bishop who is not denouncing homosexual activity as intrinsically evil and disordered at the head of this is seriously problematic. I found the quote on homosexuality I think he's referring to, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, so feel, feel free to check it out. Read if you want me to. No, I feel, you, I'll read a few more paragraphs. Okay. This is, this, is, this is golden. Again, thank God for a good prince of the church, the late Cardinal, uh, George Cardinal Pell. Diocesan bishops are the successors of the apostles, the chief teachers in each diocese, and the focus of local unity for their people and of universal unity around the Pope, the successor of Peter. Since the time of St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the bishop is also the guarantor of continuing fidelity to Christ's teaching, the apostolic tradition. They are governors and sometimes judges, as well as teachers and sacramental celebrants, and are not just wallflowers or rubber stamps. Enlarge the tent is alive to the failings of bishops who sometimes do not listen, have autocratic tendencies. See, that's what's funny. That's what's kind of ironic here, that, that, that this seems to be a criticism of those bishops who aren't listening. Um, yeah. So we're speaking. So to then look at those who are like, this is seriously problematic. I'm having people fall away from the Catholic faith because they're getting taught nonsense from the pulpit. And that nonsense isn't being corrected to then tell them that they're the problem again. Gaslighting. So I just found an interesting quote on liturgy in the document. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, the reports emphasize in many ways... Sorry, this is from 3.5... Which document? Paragraph 88. This is the document Cardinal Pell is referring to. So, uh, enlarge your tent. Um, paragraph 88 states, The reports emphasize in many ways the deep link between synodality and liturgy. Quote, In... Walking together, prayer, devotion, prayer, devotion to Mary as a missionary disciple, listening to the world, Lexio Divina and liturgical celebration inspire the purpose of belonging, uh, which is from the Columbian Report. So I think these are the synodal 
So it sounds like there were different stages, and we're at we're now approaching the continental stage or the yeah. worldwide stage. Um, and so this seems to be from the document, the synodal report from the country of Colombia. Um, but like, this is another one of those things where like, if you're already angry, I can't and help but think that this is what celibates think a good way a parent should lead their children. <laughs> Just listen to them. Maybe they just want to drink sugar and watch cartoons all day. And, you know, we should journey together. It's like, no, but there like, is an author why? natural authority here. There is a natural hierarchy in the home. And I, and I need to be listened to. The other thing is, of course, God has revealed his wishes to us, his commandments towards us. I'm sorry. I'm just, I, people should read this document because there are some quotes that I'm seeing here that like, I want to express, but. They you sound feel like they... so much worse than they are out of context. They're not sure. good. They sound... I... We'll put a link in the description below. Yeah. But I... but I do like this point of Cardinal Pell. Enlarge the tent is alive, right? It's aware. It seems to be aware of the failings of bishops who sometimes do not listen, have autocratic tendencies, and can be clericalist and individualist. Fair enough. Again, that's why our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has invited us to speak to the bishops. There are signs of hope, of effective leadership and cooperation, but the document opines that pyramid models of authority should be destroyed. I really hope it doesn't do that. And the only genuine authority comes from love and service. Right? Doesn't Love and service doesn't negate hierarchy. The opposite of hierarchy is anarchy. It's not peace or sitting around singing kumbaya. Uh, let's continue. Baptismal dignity is to be emphasized, not ministerial ordination, and governance style should be less hierarchical and more circular and participative. The main actors in all Catholic synods and councils and in all Orthodox synods have been the bishops. In a gentle, cooperative way, this should be asserted and put into practice at the continental synods so that pastoral initiatives remain within the limits of sound doctrine. Bishops are not there simply to validate due process and offer a nihil obstat to what they have observed. None of the synod's participants, lay religious, priests or bishops, are well served by the synod ruling that voting is not allowed and propositions cannot be proposed. To pass on only the organizing committee's views to the Holy Father for him to do as he decides is an abuse of synodality. A sidelining of the bishops, which is unjustified by scripture or tradition. It is not due process and it is and is liable to manipulation. I think doesn't this like enlarging of the tent and then like the more like this just feels like the church is becoming infected by the same problems that Western and American politics are affected by where we have people talking about like, oh, we need to vote and have all these voices. And then when it comes to like the time, the stage where difference can actually be made, the voting stops. Hmm. And it's a small group of people deciding. You, do you, yeah. Do you understand? What I know I, what you like, mean. Like it feels like we complain, we hear about, like if you turned on Tucker Carlson, he'd probably complain about an issue that sounded eerily similar to this tonight. Hmm. In, in American politics. So or we're if being were to, invited to give our opinion, but your fear is that the opinion is only welcomed if it aligns with... Well, like, this with, is what Pell just said, right? The only... Like, they're, they're not voting on what gets passed on to the Pope. The organizing committee is. So whoever's on the organizing right. committee, whoever was appointed there, is making the final decision. So this is, this is what he said. It's an abuse of synodality. Yes. So his complaint is that, like, one, like, what is synodality? Is it a good thing? And then two... If it is, if the things you guys say are good about synodality are good, then why aren't you, like, you abandon them as soon as it comes to the stage when it matters? Like. I'm tracking. I, I, this is like where I get to this point where it's like, I don't want to fall into the angry rad trad yeah. mindset where I'm just like screaming about yeah. like. They're evil. They they hate us, or you know, like they want to control us, or they want to like destroy the church. But like, look at that and tell me, like, if you're like a novice ordo, like, I don't even, I don't want to sound it, say in a way that sounds condescending. But yeah. if you're like a, like, think that like all this stuff is great and that Taylor Marshall is an evil person, read this stuff by Cardinal Pell. Read this document and yeah. tell me that Taylor Marshall and Jay Dyer. 
who's and orthodox, by the way, who's orthodox, still has but, criticisms but of the church. Yeah. Talks constantly about footprint. Tell me that these guys are totally insane for having this perception. We all like simple narratives. Yeah. It, it, it simplifies our worldview. We like to think that Australians are laid back, Americans are loud, at least people outside of America. The French are arrogant, you know, the Italians are whatever. Like we, we like a simple narrative. It makes our world simpler. But to point to any individual, uh, say a public figure, and to say they're entirely this way or entirely that way is is not fair. No. You know. So but that isn't to say that there aren't abuses or um I don't know, tendencies that certain people, including myself, Maya Culpa, uh, could, could lead others to. But I, you see, and one criticism I've gotten, and I know I'll get for this too. I got an email. Someone said, like, I was commenting on certain things that were taking place. And someone said, you, you need to stay away from this stuff. He's like, do what you're good at and just expound to people the beauty of the Catholic faith. Yeah. Fine. Here's the problem with that. The people who are listening to Pines with Aquinas are also trying to wrestle with things like this. So what are you going to do? Just like not engage them, not respond to them and allow certain YouTube channels. And I'm, I'm not making a statement of which ones, but some that that may cross that line and fall into conspiracy theories or something like that, or might try to justify set of accountism or schism. It's like they're the only people discussing it at that point. So you've got these well-meaning people who are trying to become Catholic, but they have legitimate questions. You see what I'm saying? I, I, or no? <laughs> I know. I totally understand what you're saying. And it's like even more regrettable because as a public figure, you get put into this place where it's an impossible dichotomy. Either you have to engage in it and feel like maybe you're falling short yeah. of, something, of some responsibility you may have as a public figure. Yeah. Or you have to like... Or you, you either have you to engage shut your in mouth. It. You either have to shut your mouth and not engage and yeah. and wonder if you're falling short of a responsibility. Or you have to not engage in it. Or you have to engage in it. And then like here we are doing this like doing this incredibly delicate dance, you and yeah. I, where we don't want to say anything that comes across in a way that can say like we're trying so hard to be Yeah. Th yeah. It's like Faithful it's as just, sons of the church. We're tr yeah, literally. It's like we're, we've got, it's like there's some like kids who are like in their teenage years, right? So they're old enough to have some idea of what's right and yeah. wrong and they want to be taught. And then they're looking at their parents and realizing that their parents need to be corrected. And here they are like in, in this awkward like, situation, in this position. awkward and sad and like just heartbreaking situation where they don't know how to do it. Yeah. That's exactly right, brother. And that's what's happening. Like you don't know how to say these things in a way. And so all you can do is pray and ask the Lord for the strength and for the strength to to say it correctly. I it's like it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah. Uh, we're almost done here. By an enormous margin, regularly worshiping Catholics everywhere do not endorse the present synod findings. How's that? So if you want to listen to us, and by you by if you want to listen to us like we're talking about a german bishop who is it seems very close to endorsing sodomy or at least seems to refuse to denounce them as intrinsically disordered like that's one of the guys in charge of the synod so I like that by an enormous march. So I want to invite because it's not just Americans who listen to this show. I think that's the other kind of way people gaslight the trads as they say, this is just an American thing. First of all, as an Australian, I'm offended for my American friends when they're told that. It's like, even if it were, why would that, why would it follow that they don't have a point? Do you know yeah, what I mean? Even if it, even if it was only us Americans who were being, had crazy cardinals and bishops, then all the more reason to in that state like there's all these quotes from the middle the middle 20th century popes about how like the nation and um or the, the you know the, the the that um more secular bonds of people are still matter mm -hmm. yeah and, and not just correcting our own bishops but like pointing to the abuse of other bishops say the german bishops and then yeah. you and then americans get told yeah. well, that's just an american thing which is such a sneering remark like, couldn't it be possible that certain American Catholics know what the hell they're talking about and might have a point? Shouldn't we be, uh, shouldn't we be listening to all members of the church? And don't American Catholics deserve to be taught well? 
And but the point I was trying to make is just that I have many listeners throughout the world from all different countries. We checked yesterday and saw we had seven downloads from Vatican City. Yeah. <laughs> so wherever you are, express Shout this to your Francis. bishop. He's listening. Uh, well, no, but I don't think so. But well, if you are, love you, Pope Francis, um, praying for you. But um, tell your bishops, say we want to be taught the faith. And whenever you hear a bishop teach the truth, and of course they very often do, thank them for it. Whenever a priest or a bishop says something that kicks up against secular and satanic dogma, praise them for it, you know? All right, oh, and let's finish this. Um, Neither is there much enthusiasm at senior church levels. Continued meetings of this sort deepen division, and a knowing few can exploit the muddle and goodwill. The ex-Anglicans among us are right to identify the deepening confusion, the attack on traditional morals, and the insertion into the dialogue of neo-Marxist jargon about exclusion, alienation, identity, marginalization, the voiceless, LGBTQ, as well as the displacement of Christian notions of forgiveness, sin, sacrifice, healing, redemption. Why the silence on the afterlife of reward or punishment on the four last things, death and judgment, heaven and hell. So far, the synodal way has neglected, indeed downgraded the transcendent, covered up the centrality of Christ with appeals to the Holy Spirit and encouraged resentment, especially among participants. Working documents are not part of the magisterium. They are one basis for discussion, to be judged by the whole people of God and especially by the bishops with and under the Pope. The working document needs radical changes. The bishops must realize that there is work to be done in God's name sooner rather than later. And so we just pray that Pope Francis will put a stop to some of this craziness. We pray that some of these bishops who are advocating for intrinsically evil things would repent because, look, here's the thing. All of us are going to have to face judgment. I'm going to have to face judgment for all of the words I speak carelessly god have mercy on me a sinner and so will our cardinals yeah i was talking to a friend recently who was looking at the state of the catholic church and he was bemoaning it and i said i think it's way worse than you think it is i think it's way worse than taylor marshall thinks it is um but i said uh he said to me but what i realized is the largest part of this church is the church triumphant they are part of the same church so we might look to some of our leaders we might look to our own failings, our own cowardice and despair. But our king is Jesus Christ. Our queen mother is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our older brothers and sisters are in heaven. The angels, the archangels. I mean, there is so much power there that there's really no call to despair, but there is a call, I think, because Pope Francis has asked for it, to offer our feedback to our, to our bishops, to our priests. Yeah, I think Matt and I will be reaching out to... Our Bishop Montfortin. Yeah, let's do that. Um, and we'd encourage you guys to do the same for you. Should we close with the prayer yeah. here? I feel like we should. This Absolutely. is a really tough discussion. I feel like we should ask the Lord to come into it. Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things, you are the treasury of blessing and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O gracious one. Father, we ask your blessing upon your church. We ask your blessing upon us, humble sons and daughters. We ask your blessing upon the clergy who are also your humble sons. Guide your church and help us not to lose heart. Help us not just to get our dopamine fix from news, ecclesial news articles. Help us to be first and foremost men and women of prayer who wake up every morning and surrender their day to you, who pray throughout the day, who teach their children the faith. Um, and we trust in you. We thank you for Pope Francis. We ask you to bless him and to guide him as our universal shepherd. And we pray for the heretics within the church that they Amen. would be instructed and converted. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Blessed Mother, pray for us. Pray for me. Pray for our listeners. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Anthony of Padua, hammer of heretics, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit.